Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass PNC, and I'm joined, as usual, by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? Well, I'm doing well, Orson. How are you? Oh, there we go. Uh, I'm, do <laughs> I'm doing fine. We're joined by quite a special guest today, someone who has been a very important part of the cryptocurrency skepticism and criticism space. Mr. David Gerard. first of all, how are you? Good evening. I'm doing great. It's a lovely sunny spring evening here in uh, London. Well, it's good to have you on because you were at the forefront of cryptocurrency skepticism and criticism. You wrote Attack of the 50-Foot Blockchain, which Bennett and I both read and enjoyed. You also authored the Libra book. Forgive me, the name is escaping me. Libra Shrugged. And then they changed the name to DM a month after it came out. Obviously, my fault. Right, this right. is direct personal attack by David Marcus. <laughs> David Marcus was scared of your book. <laughs> I was quite nice to him in the book. <laughs> it's not David versus Goliath. It's David versus David. <laughs> I think it's important to have you on because, uh, well, for a few reasons, but I, I think mostly because you've been here a lot longer than we have, and you've played an important role calling out what you perceive as, I guess, an industry worth of bullshit. I mean, that's an objectively correct description so of cryptocurrency, <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about it. Obvious, I'm sure you've gone over this a hundred times, but I'd love to hear how you first discovered cryptocurrency and why you've been so critical of it. I started looking into it around 2011. I'm, I think I first heard of it in 2010 when WikiLeaks got cut off from PayPal and MasterCard and Visa, and I was outraged. I thought, they can't do that. They can do that. And, you know... Someone suggested, oh, they could use Bitcoins. What are they? Some sort of internet money. Um, I looked at it a bit further and discovered that this was some sort of weird internet nerd money being done by our very good friends, the basement-dwelling internet libertarians, who make everything better. And I had long had experience of these guys online because they've made things better online for decades. And um, Bitcoin <laughs> proved to be no exception. I predicted at the time that this would just be an inexhaustible mine of comedy gold. And it has turned out to be so, just by the nature of the people who started it and why they would have started it. I hadn't even looked into it deeply at that stage. It was just anything done by these people would be basically a manifestation of just world fallacy amongst privileged nerds who are convinced that the entire rest of the world is a simplified version of front-end JavaScript. Um, and, you know, these people are endemic, and they're endemic for... I, I've been acquainted with these people for many years. So Bitcoin is just another one of those. So I followed it a bit for a few years and gradually built up the uh, Bitcoin article in Rational Wiki, a small skeptics wiki, which I um, edit on. Um, I built that up from like two lines to a reasonable article. Um, and I don't know why, but for some reason around 2014, I found myself on Reddit R Buttcoin, which is just a wonderful place full of heartwarming people and the correct views on things. So that was great. Um, like I am, like you called me before one of the first uh, skeptics in of crypto, and um, that's absolutely false. Uh, everything I did was basically built on a whole bunch of these guys who correctly called these bozos out very early on are you calling me a liar no you're just david how dare you're just you under informed <laughs> and i'm here to help you with that you know in my educational role i mean some of these guys they're still around like george stolfi who still tweets occasionally he viciously dismantled this nonsense on um uh, butcoin for quite some time um if you ever want detailed expositions of precisely why lightning network cannot possibly scale. yeah well we had a good friend of ours was uh uh working to build l2 um and uh lightning you know lightning network and uh yeah he stopped the whole idea doesn't would literally require new mathematics it's one of those it's like some of ethereum's wilder fancies where you realize that actually I don't have a computer science degree. I bombed out repeatedly, so I had to get a real job. But um, it was like, I, I do respect the fact that sometimes you just actually got to know shit. And that never sunk in with the crypto crowd who are really full of this. I mean, it's a standard 
Silicon Valley stereotype, the Heinleinian hero who pulls things forth from his forehead um, and doesn't need to do the reading because he is enlightened by his own intelligence. So I got on to Reddit Buckcoin and hung out on there from about late 2014 onwards, which was great, watching just after Mt. Gox had crashed and that hilarious moment in January 5th, 2015 when Bitcoin dipped to $150. But it was um, really interesting. So then I joined Something Awful, which is the great big message board where all the internet's worst troublemakers were in the 2000s. And they're still there. It's just now they're 20 years older and um, they have backaches. So Butcoin actually started there. The people who run the Butcoin Twitter and the Butcoin Foundation website, they started on um, something awful in the Butcoin threads. And again, they were calling out Bitcoin really early. I mean, I could not have written my book without tremendous help from people on something awful in Reddit. There's a whole lot of people that came before me. I mean, I'm just someone who's like still here and persisting because I don't know when to quit. That's my next question is that considering your perspective on this, what is driving you to continue to, to stick around? So like I wrote the book and I thought this would be a self-published book by someone with decent social media. It'll sell 300 copies easily. But it came out in July 2017, which was when the 2017 bubble was really on its upslope. And so there were no other critical books. There's hundreds, literally hundreds of books on how great crypto is and why you should get into it. And there's nearly no solidly critical books. There's a few good histories, mm -hmm. a few bad histories, but for critical books, there's Jeffrey Robinson's um, Bitcoin from 2014. He basically spent his the 90s writing about financial crimes. And then there was David Columbia's book, The Politics of Bitcoin, which I will never stop recommending to people because um, it's essential reading. And it was written in 2016, but its history and insight into the history is absolutely solid. So chapter three of my book, his book is the extended version of that. And then there was my book and there was no one else. So I, I got the press come to me and talked about it and the book took off and it's like kept on selling. And then it took off again in the 2021 bubble and it's coming up to like 15,000 sales. This is not what a self-published book does, but mine did. So cool. Yeah. But so is that the main reason that you, the main re reason you're saying that you've chosen to stick around is because you feel as though you're one of the only critical voices? Um, it's because it turned into half a job. I mean, I mm. stick around because it's interesting. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating and it's an endless clown car of... Um, speeding towards a dumpster on fire with more clowns jumping on. I nicked that description from someone from Butcoin who was using it to describe Bitcoin's El Salvador, but really it describes all the crypto. I think my favorite description of Bitcoin period came from, I think it was, was it, I don't know if it was Butcoin or that tweet where someone talks about, imagine leaving your car motor running. Yeah. I, that's my, that's my, I don't know. I can't get the exact phrase down, but. Something like running your car to solve Sudokos you can buy heroin with. Right. Yes. And like around July, I think, uh, my wife said to me, oh, you should do a Patreon for this stuff. I went, no, no, I want to stop thinking about this and write about something else. And she was, of course, correct, which is a lesson I'll probably learn eventually. So, yeah, um, I started a Patreon just for the blog and I put up early release things of stuff I've written for other places. And it's like um, $700 a month now, which is pretty good. And that plus book income, plus freelancing income, plus doing panels, which unfortunately just didn't happen much in 2021, which is a real pity because it turns out the nodding and smiling racket is where the money is as a writer. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, you know, um, and panels are great as well because, you know, I don't have to do any preparation. I just have to go and mouth off. It's good. I can do that. I know my lines. <laughs> so, yeah, but also given the amount of work I put in compared to the money, it's clearly I'm not in it. If I was in it for the money, I'd be doing something else, yeah. <laughs> You'd be writing one of the hundreds of other books that are positive. <laughs> yeah. It's like I said to my wife, oh, why am I doing this book rubbish? I should do an ICO and no. But it could totally be no. You only get one chance to sell your soul. <laughs> I can honestly say that I have passed the moral test. I am too dumb to take the money. <laughs> oh, 
clearly we are as well sitting here doing a podcast for free. Being a skeptic or cryptocurrency critic is a challenging pursuit just because uh, the cryptocurrency community can be a bit toxic and standoffish at times. And I know there were lots of times I almost wanted to step away because of that. I'm like, this can't all be worth it. Have you ever felt that or do you keep more of a laugh at the responses kind of mentality? So the online weirdos are the worst 10%. And the worst 10% of anything, they're going to be bloody awful. I was actually surprised when I started doing panels in like 2017, 2018, and I met Bitcoiners and they were normal. They were much more optimistic about the future of this stuff, but they agreed on consensus reality. They were normal people. So, and they're fine. I've got like friends who are into crypto lots and I'm on lots of crypto chats with decent people I'd do stuff for, you know, a lot of people are fine. One thing I surprised me when the book came out was a lot of people who were Bitcoiners liked it because it was actually reality based instead of frothing unrealistic nonsense. And they found that refreshing. Like the space had gotten too BSE even for them. So the fact that I wrote down facts and had about 400 footnotes with little numbers and everything, and you could check them and in the ebook you could click on them, you know, um, that helped my credibility a lot. I, I mean, there's frequently times, even still when I'm writing or researching something, when I uh, pull your book off the shelf so I can crib off the footnotes in the bibliography to find the original sources for <laughs> certain claims and stuff. Fantastic. And, and like, I think you were still, like, even at the time, one of the only people who got uh, Phil Potter, one of the Bitfinex executives, to go on record about the hack. Um, yeah, I didn't actually quote him in the book, but the description of the hack is basically what, from him. Now, Tether have been caught in a number of untruths in the past. However, his description matches the previous description I'd be given by someone else who I can't name, but I bet they're watching so high, which I posted to Reddit Butcoin. And um, then someone from Bitfinex got in touch and said, look, that's not how it happened. Do you want to talk to Phil? They really didn't want the description I had going out. So he gave me a more detailed description, which, well, it's basically a more detailed version of the same thing and it rings true. I wrote a blog post recently about Heather Morgan. Um, Razzlecon. Whatever her husband's name was, Ilya or something. Ilya Lichtenstein. That's the one, Ilya Lichtenstein. That I suspect it could be a um, social engineering rather than some sort of computer science whiz-bang genius. Most hacking is just social engineering and doorknob rattling and persistence, you know. Um, hate to say that maybe... Maybe the Bitfinex and Tether executives aren't the brightest bulbs in the whole world. You know, it's it's interesting because Phil is actually, was actually one of the most qualified of them because he was an experienced trader. And, you know, he knew which what was constituted good conduct and what didn't constitute good conduct. Whichever one he chose, that's a matter that's between him and God. But he knows the difference. You know, he has that sort of free will. Um, but he was an experienced trader. He knew what he he knew what the job was. I mean, Razzlecom was great to see. It was like this was like going back into the early days of Bitcoin. Like they were all a bunch of weirdo freaks. It was amazing. The absolutely bizarre characters who got into this stuff just because they thought magical internet money was a fun idea. I think they're still there, don't you? Oh, well, they are. They're just you know, overshadowed by the number go ups. Yeah, it's gotten a little more institutionalized, you know, since like CME had futures and there's big firms trading it now. There's there's a bit of a different mentality when you like look at the average Bitcoiner than there was in like 2016. Yeah, that's I think that's actually a good question. How have you noticed as a skeptic and critic? How have you noticed the space change over the past, uh, let's say, yeah, five years? The scams have gotten bigger. A lot of it, I think the um, authorities have just been asleep because no one cares about crypto. It's tiny. In the scheme of finance, it's really not very big at all. Now they're worrying because they're worried about these guys becoming systemic. That's the big threat because, you know, if you have an $80 billion institution called Tether and it's messing around with money in ways that are clearly completely shonky, you don't want that going near the actual economy where people live. On the other hand, if it's often its own little sequestered bubble, let them kill each other. Let them fight. So it's when they start threatening the world with uh, interfering with the real economy where people live that the regulators get upset. I think that if uh, the crypto world does not like regulators being up in their business, they need to blame Facebook because Libra absolutely frightened the crap out of them. Every regulator, finance ministry, central bank. I mean, I wrote a book where the 
central banks are the good guys. <laughs> and that took some doing. <laughs> This was actually going to be my next question is because I remember reading your coverage of the Libra hearings and reading through Libra Shrugged, and I thought you laid out the case quite convincingly that it was a wake up call mm. to a lot of regulators in these financial groups that crypto is small, but the same ideology, the same technology can be used by these other groups to reach this kind of scale where it becomes a threat. And the dichotomy that was so strange for me is you heard all these central bankers, these finance ministers, these regulators making statements that seemed like they were going to apply to a lot of other stable coins and other things. And the crypto industry seemed to largely ignore those hearings. Like it was very rarely discussed and it was a strange thing to observe. Do you have any thoughts from that period? So the reason why the, they went after Libra was because it was retail. Like it was supposed to be actual money in the economy doing the job of dollars or euros or pounds or whatever. When a regulator says the word systemic, that should be correctly interpreted as they're sending off the air raid sirens, right? Systemic means this could break things. Because the one thing they fear more than anything is another 2008 financial crisis. And like I say in the book, the Libra Reserve Plan would have done another 2008 or risked it, you know? A great big money market fund being run by bozos basically they had arrogant plan and they had no idea what the hell they were doing perfect combination very facebook <laughs> i mean i wrote that foreign policy article in june 2019 and um my editor turned it up a lot and made it a lot more hard-hitting and vicious and i had nothing on the honorable gentlemen gentlewomen of the uh, senate and congress in july holy shit they just ripped piss out of david marcus i mean i can't really <laughs> fault him because could you do two seven hour sessions one after the other in front of the people running the world's largest economy you'd probably slip up occasionally maybe but we we don't have much to hide i and we're not trying to build the next uh too big to fail money market fund so well exactly so they don't worry about Tether because Tether is just people playing with monopoly money, but they will worry if they go near US customers, but they'll worry about that because advice to investors. I did like, I know you disagreed, Bennett, but Doomberg's theory about why the SEC rejects spot ETFs but accepts a futures ETF is the futures ETF isn't doesn't touch a Bitcoin. It's just a bet on dollars in dollars in the price in dollars, whereas a spot ETF involves buying Bitcoins. Getting back to your question, why is the crypto world like ignoring the regulators and the things they're saying? It's sort of defiance, sort of stupidity, sort of performative stupidity a lot, because these people are not unintelligent. And they also know what money is and how it works and what the rules are, at least some of them. But God damn, they come out with stuff that makes them sound like dumbasses. Well, and, and uh, th that is something we talked about a little bit when um, John Reed Stark came on the show, former chief of the SEC Office of Internet Enforcement. And he referenced like the Dow report and how it laid out how this was pretty clearly a security and they got this order and then like laid out all of Jay Clayton's statements on how basically every ICO he saw was a security. And yet the claim you hear from a lot of cryptocurrency people is we just haven't gotten any clarity yet. How are we supposed to know? And uh... clarity is absurd, meaning let me do what I want. They're very into the theory of forgiveness rather than permission, which makes sense in some industries and in some ways. Like I'm not opposed to that uh, in theory, but man, it has not been good for making cryptocurrency look like it's a legitimate industry no. because what what we see because of this is a pro proliferation of scams and frauds and and not just like not just ones that are. Uh, not just ones like Enron or something where it's like it's massive, at least like on some level, I guess on some scale, Enron was providing services to people, but like it was a giant fraud, right? It was a, it was one big massive fraud. But the stuff that we see in cryptocurrency is like fucking BitConnect, you know, <laughs> you go, what? Like this is such it's so obvious. It's just too obvious. That's why I've got these little stickers I um, send out to people which was actually a design some guy did on something awful, Bitcoin. It can't be that stupid. You must be explaining it wrong. You hear these dumbass schemes and you go, that can't be right. Surely 10,000 obvious objections. No, it's actually that dumb. You know, you get this over and over. Like 
the dumbass schemes that just could not work. And you go, how do you get away with that? And, oh, that's right. You get away with it because no one bothers prosecuting you for your blatant crimes. You know, oh, I, and this 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 goes back to what we, we've been seeing and which we did an, an episode on as well about like the ponzonomics of cryptocurrency and how like they're almost trying to normalize po Ponzi schemes as a form of economics. And you're well, like, the that's... dollar is a Ponzi scheme if you really think about it. Ah! Or if you really don't, <laughs> if you deliberately try not to think at all, you might come to that same conclusion. If you think the way I do, <laughs> it's like there's a lot of performative stupidity. There's a lot of people pretending the rules don't apply to them because they shouldn't. A lot of it is targeted internally. Have you noticed that? A lot of them, they do long threads which are basically designed to cheer the troops. Let's remember, this is a scam with real victims. We know the economics of crypto must be zero sum as long as you're keeping count in dollars and they're all keeping count in dollars because no one really believes that hyper-Bitcoinization is going to happen. I mean, Jesus. I mean, a few, yeah. a few of the so-called weirdos from the old days probably still believe. Yeah, but they're no one. <laughs> You know what I mean. They're all in it for the dollars. Oh, the, yeah. Quite definitely US dollar fiat. There is no dollar that comes out of crypto to a winner that was not put in by a loser. And there must always be less coming out than goes in because so much is bled away by the miners, the service providers, that sort of thing. It's like if it was at least as regulated as gambling, that would be one thing, you know. I got, I just got recently asked this question, um, and I'm going to do a shameless shill for PJ Voigt's uh, Crypto Island podcast where he did an episode called the, called the Skeptic, and I got to chat with PJ for a really long time. One of the questions he had for me was, how have you not been driven completely crazy by this? And I gave the I gave the typical answer of like, well, I was crazy before I came here, which is true. But also, I think it's an easy way to like write off that question. And I think it is hard to not be driven crazy if you watch price and if you think about like how long you've been following this space. And I know it's such a simple question and we get through it gets thrown in all of our faces like almost daily that like, well, we're no coiners. We've we could have bought in at any price. We weren't obviously not going to make it. But why Why haven't you been driven crazy, David? Well, um, because, you know, I'm an old guy and I'm set in my ways and I know how I think. Once you realize that the words Bitcoin and blockchain, when I'm asked these days, what is a Bitcoin? How does a blockchain work? The correct answer is not to go into technical detail. Don't go into technical detail. The first answer is, it's a promise you can get rich for free. Remember, Bitcoin didn't start as a scam. It started as it was started by anarcho-capitalist libertarians who were very sincere people. They honestly believed this was the best thing they could do. And even they very early on thought we're going to get rich from this for free. So, you know, the whole pitch is variations on you can get rich for free. You can get magic. Magic happens. Of course, magic doesn't happen. And actually, you're going to lose your money unless you're lucky, in which case, well done. You know, you can totally make money in crypto. I'd never say you can't make money in crypto, right? But it is an unregulated shark pool. And you'll make money if you're a better shark than all the sharks who are already in there and present and set up the pool. It's so it's so e easy to even reflect on, like, if someone got involved in Bitcoin really early and let's say they held their coins at the wrong exchange, they're not rich now. Like, that's all it takes. That is that's that is all that it, you need to happen to... Well, I think you need to read crypto, crypt, crypto Twitter a bit more because they will reassure you they bought all their coins in 2009. <laughs> and withdrew from Mt. Gox a year before the hack, before withdrawals got mm -hmm. shut down. Yeah. After being here for so long and seeing that Bitcoin has not failed, I mean, I, I, I don't know how you feel, but like, I guess my perspective is that it's not ever in my lifetime likely, at least, to it's, it's possible it could go to zero. I think the likelihood that Bitcoin goes to zero in my lifetime is minimal, though. Um, and I'm wondering what your perspective is on that. And like, if, if you do think of it as purely a scam or if there's more nuance to it to you now or if, if you totally write the whole entire space off it's a very nuanced and detailed scam with a lot of interesting bells and whistles yeah i'm not a fan 
I think it'll be around for decades, obviously, because what do you need for Bitcoin to exist? Copy of the software, copy of the blockchain, two or more interested enthusiasts, and they can do transactions to their heart's content. You know, it'll be just like the early days with Satoshi and Hal. But in terms of how exchangeable it is for actual money, that's a completely separate question. I did, I've been saying at least for the last few years, this is on record, that um, the future of cryptocurrency is to become increasingly regulated and it'll eventually become a asset, an asset that you can only really get into if you're one of the rich guys. With, with the goal being what for that then? Just because otherwise the authorities aren't going to put up with it. So speculative, just as a speculative asset, you think the, the, yeah, basically like a casino, it can't possibly work like currency. Like it literally just is not useful for that job, but as a speculative asset, well, you know, it's digital gold. So it, it's a well-known <laughs> inflation hedge. Um, I saw a great clip of Ben McKenzie on CNBC where, um, they said the host that they say it's an inflation. He said, didn't it go down 30%? And she went, well, I didn't, uh, she backed down immediately. It was great. But um, I think that it'll be regulated. And we see this. Now, the regulation seems to be coming not from the regulatory authorities, but from the money laundering authorities. But, you know, we'll take what we can get. Uh, just so I understand, I think, so, and just to say it back to you, what I perceive your perspective as in full is that you've found work by covering this space critically and skeptically that you will continue to cover it because you suspect that this is a speculative volatile asset with a lot of fans so it will be around for a long time and that regardless of how you personally feel about it there will be perceived value as a speculative asset and therefore it's not likely to go away and it's it's here to be it's to, gonna to be go in... on for a while but bitcoin is here to stay as an extremely small statement as i said all you need is the software the blockchain and two or more people how it interacts with actual money is a much more complicated question i expect everything to tighten down remember the only advantage this stuff has as a financial instrument is the degree to which it can evade regulation when it can't evade regulation it stops being a better instrument that's why crypto does not work for the remittance case, for example. Yeah. And the absolutely comical nonsense attempts to use it as money in El Salvador, which are just absolutely incredible and a detailed worked example of this stuff just not working. I mean, even blockchain for enterprise, it's a promise that you can get organizational efficiency for free by magic, you know. And I noticed something else. There were lots of Lots of talk of enterprise blockchain in 2017 and 2018. Then there was nothing in 2019 and 2020. Then Bitcoin went up and they started talking about it again last year. I got to go on one panel and say, you realize the only reason this panel exists is because the price of Bitcoin is up. And they acknowledged the point. I mean, there's no more interesting story in finance than number go up. It's literally the point of finance after all. But um, I'd like a bit more interrogation into why it's going up. I also think that a lot of people have forgotten what unregulated markets look like. They're really used to the last 90 years of having the SEC and stuff and regulation and markets that behave and are monitored and have rules and stuff. And this turns out to work out quite well because, you know, efficient markets don't happen just by happenstance or naturally or anything. They collapse in a whole bunch of obvious ways if they're not monitored and regulated. But crypto is like the amazing stories of stock operators from the 19th century and up to the 1920s, which led to the great good, the, the Black Friday crash of 1929. So yeah, it works as long as it can evade regulation and it stops working insofar as it gets regulated. One thing you said there, which I thought was striking, because it's a thing I've talked about with Daniel Goldman, who we've had on the show, who's a developer over at Arbitrum, is that when Russia attacked Ukraine and you had a bunch of Bitcoiners proudly bragging that Bitcoin could not be used to effectively evade sanctions at a nation state level, which is an analysis I agree with based on the liquidity for these things and stuff like that. Yeah, I said the same but, thing. Um, it's obvious. Daniel noted that, like, guys, I'm not sure you want to be bragging about that. I'm not sure you've really had like sink in what was supposed to be the goal of this system and like the evidence that perhaps it's not working the way it was intended to. So you had all of these Bitcoiners, all of these anarch 
anarcho-libertarian capitalists who wanted to create this censorship-resistant system that would allow... And they're all crawling up the SEC's backside. Yeah, and they, they're all like, listen, the Treasury says we're okay and can't be used to evade sanctions. And they say then without a hint of irony. And uh, you That's because the only ideology is number go up. Exactly. The rest is just memes, promotional memes. It was heartening, actually, how many... Bitcoin libertarians deeply objected to the way that Bitcoin is introduced in El Salvador. Yeah, well, as somebody who first found out about Bitcoin in 2017, I was actually like excited by the idea. Like it actually, I thought it was really cool. I mean, I still think the idea of like non-nation state money is a really fun, cool idea. I have nothing, I'm not, I, like I am not opposed to that at all. But I do think that it has clearly been perverted, especially when you look at that particular example where you're like, wow, so you're talking about a dictator who is going to take this money and force it on his population. And you're like, yay, are you nuts? That's against everything that this was supposed to stand for at yeah. the beginning. I mean, it happened as soon as like 2011 when Mt. Gox was up and running and finally Bitcoin had a meaningful price. You know, you could exchange Bitcoins for dollars with any reliability. It had a price. The scammers swooped in. And a lot of those scammers, of course, were people with a long history of scamming, mail fraud, that sort of thing. I mean, Jerry Cotton starting a Ponzi schemes at 16 and going to found a Bitcoin exchange. And then Patron coming back. Holy crap, that was amazing. That there's anyone who supports him is also astounding to me. Because you think? I, I was so great. I, <laughs> but I was so grateful when the community kind of rallied around me recently. And we won't talk about that. But I just want to say that, like, it was really like you talk about going to conferences and meeting coiners, libertarians, whatever, who are very much just normal people and actually like lovely to talk to probably a lot of the time. And um, yeah, like I felt like I had a lot of support from people who I thought hated my guts and hated Bennett and I doing our, our criticism and skepticism. But there are plenty of them who who aren't like Max Kaiser and Michael Saylor, you know, who aren't who aren't these people telling you to sell your fucking house and not keep any cash on hand. Yeah, it's um... not financial advice, though. Huh. If you say not financial right. advice, you can tell people to sell their house to buy speculative volatile assets. You just have to say those three words. There are a number of things I do think, like, I do think there is, you need forms of money which, which are outside the eye of Sauron, outside complete government surveillance and so on. Marginalized people need those. Uh, crypto can do that job a bit, but then it comes with the rest of crypto as baggage, and that's a problem. Also, the people who promote this are generally um, well-off nerds up to rich libertarian leaning anarcho-capitalist who have no understanding of the word freedom other than freedom of my money. True freedom and liberty is when I get your money. <laughs> and a front to human dignity and Western civilization itself is when you get my money. <laughs> That's the complete ideology in a nutshell. I do think it, it's it's generally what I've what I've seen is that skeptics and critics tend to be more accepting of some form of governance as opposed to a lot of coiners We've tried who, the other way. even if it doesn't work, I know, I know, I know, but they, they really, I think they, they believe that, and, and maybe the way I'm terming it is wrong, but it seems like they perceive that governance should be done through cryptocurrency, like through the monetary means of this, you know, new mechanism, protocol, whatever, that this is how we, this is how freedom is made as though there's no other nuance or, you know, subject matter or reason for government to exist other than money. It's all about money. The standard trope is that you can always answer these extreme libertarian hopes and dreams with, on the other hand, history. You know, <laughs> libertarianism isn't a wrong desire. Obviously, nobody wants the government in their face. Governments are stupid. They do dumb things. They're really annoying. And Less regulation, that's a reasonable thing to want. You should absolutely fight regulations if they're a pain on the backside, you know, that sort of thing. But you are never going to reach the anarcho-capitalist ideal condition. It's just not a thing that happens. This goes for any of these political ideologies too, right? I mean, like, this is the same for communism, for capitalism, for, like, all of these... There's no good idea you can't turn into a bad idea if you just do it hard <laughs> enough. Crypto advocates do have a tendency to try to turn their ideas up to 11. <laughs> Just really crank that dial and see just how crazy we can make these systems. 13-year-olds in the basement, no matter how many decades they actually be. <laughs> 
the other striking thing about me for cryptocurrency is how short the memories are for cryptocurrency advocates. My God, yes. The only people who remember stuff are the critics. I mean, who these days in crypto remembers the dog dick coffee table? Nobody. <laughs> that, that's true. But like, and that's the reason I end up so often uh, recommending your book. And the other one I recommend is Nathaniel Popper's Digital Gold, because it's one of the better histories of the early Bitcoin era. Yeah. Because... Without those, you see so many people just repeating the same altcoin scams from 2014 and 2015 and a new wave of suckers buying in. And it's just... It's all the same scam. It was Bitcoin in 2011. It was altcoins in later 2011 onwards. ICOs were the same scam. DeFi was the same scam. NFTs are absolutely the same scam. It's all selling you crypto magic beans with the promise that you will get rich for free. And what's really striking for me is just like, like Olympus Dow eventually hit like a total market cap, multiple billions. And like, if you read through their documentation, in their documentation, they say this can continue to be a wealth generating machine at any scale. They had discovered perpetual economic motions and were just giving it away to people. You'd almost and think they were Ponzi schemers. You would almost think so. And like, that's the conclusion I ended up having to come to when I read this. Because I'm like, well, they started out as kind of like the honest Ponzi's you sometimes see in cryptocurrency. And then just... What a great phrase that is. Yeah. Honest Ponzi's. Then they tell all the people, actually, this will go on forever. I, I, I wrote an article a while ago because I prefer to look at these. I You're right in that um, critics and skeptics, I think, focus on the past and the rest of these people are very future oriented, right? Like they, they prefer to talk about the unknowns and possibles. And we're all talking about things that definitely have happened in the past. But um, I wrote about Caritas, which was a Romanian Ponzi scheme. And yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's it's such a fun Ponzi scheme to me because, as I said in the article, when you had the original Ponzi scheme, there was actual it was impossible, but there was like a real arbitrage mechanism that he discovered. Right. It, he couldn't make it happen, but it was a real world thing that he was at least able to describe. And people would be like, oh, actually, I guess that might be a real thing that you could do that you could make money off of. So the difference between that and Caritas was that in Caritas, he was like, it's a mutual aid game. I don't know. It's, you, you know, you put money in, you get more money out. And everyone was like, it sounds great. I'm in. And you're, and so I called that a pure Ponzi versus like a Ponzi, you know? I think the purity there is at least they're being open and honest about like, I, it's just uh, more money. You know, more money is going to get created. I, if I remember right, there was a period where one of those like pure Ponzi's, honest Ponzi's, whatever you want to call them, was the highest like smart contract by total value locked on Ethereum at one point. That was that automatic one, wasn't it? I, for I remember. I forget its name. That was in 2018, right? FOMO 3HD is what I think it was called. That's oh one. yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Um, but I think every if you look at like what are the what is tr what is Tron used for? Another cryptocurrency that Justin Sun, you know copy and pasted from Ethereum. Um, what is Tron used for? It's a bunch of gambling dApps. It's like, it's a bunch of garbage that is basically just a bunch of Ponzi schemes on a protocol. Like that's not the best use case in the world. I can argue that there's some cool stuff when it comes to non-governmental money. I can argue that like, oh, if, if um, someone I know in a country that's sanctioned, like I technically would possibly be able to move bitcoin to them maybe without being traced if i did enough good opsec i don't know um but anyway there's some possible use cases there when you talk about like tron or these other things you you go oh so it's just a ponzi machine nick Jarbo came up with the concept of smart contracts and 20 years later we discovered the main use case of smart contracts penny sock scams Sometimes there's a fancy bit on the side, but mostly just a straight up penny sock scam. Bennett, do you have any other questions? Because I'm. I would note that basically the trouble is that Get Rich for Free is an incredibly popular product, right? You don't even have to deliver at any point. If you just offer this product, people will queue up to give you money because people are suckers. And actually, it is in society's interest to stop this stuff because it's bad. You know, this should be a simple enough point to explain the whole thing. And everything else I say is a more elaborate, detailed version of that, pretty much. And it's unfortunate I have to keep making this point. 
but it's like the best book ever written about Bitcoin is Extraordinary Popular Delusions by Charles Mackay. And that was written in 1841. I agree. That's a, a great, great book recommendation. Um, oh, my God. Yeah, it's it, it is such a fan, it is such a fantastic book. And there's some really crazy, just crazy stories in there. Um, but uh I, I said something similar in the in the PJ Voigt thing where I said, like, when I started this journey as a cryptic and skeptic, I feel like I was, like, attacking people more. And now I've realized that that is definitely not the answer to getting people to notice what's going on. You do need that as well, but you need all the other ways to say it as well. You need all of them at once. I think that's such a turnoff for these people where it's like they know they know exactly what they're doing. Sometimes people just need to be shamed. <laughs> you know, it's like all the approaches work just fine. And telling them that actually they're doing a bad thing in a way that makes them comfortable is not my first goal. What if they're an effective altruist who promises to use all their ill-begotten gains to save the world? Then is it okay? Send Chris Hansen around for a hard drive inspection. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, there was nothing that warmed me to crypto Twitter like having all these coiners tell me in all seriousness that Cody Wilson was set up by this 60-year-old hussy sent by the FBI to entrap this innocent 30-year-old Bitcoiner. As some Crypto Island project put it, uh, what, what did they say? The age of consent is... Uh... It's a mental, mental it's maturity. about a mental, a mental maturity. That's right. Uh, Not being able to live within 500 feet of a school is a small price to pay for <laughs> true freedom. You no coiner, <laughs> adult fucker. <laughs> no coiner is great. It's the best slur. It's wonderful. Isn't it? It's amazing. It's like, I think we can honestly say there's seven to eight billion no coiners in the world because the general public Whenever the companies try to sell them on, hey, we've done an NFT, give us free money. The customer base reacts, no, this sucks. Get out of here. <laughs> you guys are terrible. In 2021, the general public finally learnt what crypto was and came to understand it. And I think they understood it correctly. It's rip off garbage, get rich quick schemes, buy scammers, <laughs> and they don't want to borrow of it. And it's like, not even the proof of work thing. Even if it was all proof of stake, it would still suck because the structure of it is made to run scams. Someone asked me if I, if I like, what would make me feel vindicated in the space. And it's funny because I do think that years ago I would have told them, well, when Tether collapses and, uh, you know, like I would have very specific things set out for what would have made me feel vindicated. Uh, but I can say fully that I totally feel vindicated. Like, I feel like everything that I perceived as being a major issue with the cryptocurrency space, it has played out as such. It definitely, to like, oh, has Tether been uh, forthcoming and, and transparent and clean this whole time? I think we all understand absolutely not. And has it been used probably for some really nefarious shit? I think we all understand probably yes. And has there been immeasurable amounts of scams and frauds for Bennett and I to talk about on a twice week? weekly basis. Absolutely. I guess I'm fine with that. I guess that's where we're at. And I feel okay with that. You know, if you like, if you're into talking about scams, like Mackay was writing in 1841, scams, bubbles, over enthusiastic investors, that sort of thing. This is eternal. It's always going to happen. It's human nature. As long as there's money, there's going to be people who go a bit funny about money. You know, it's because it's interesting. And it's a reasonable thing to try to warn people off it. But it's also fascinating, you know, I, um, it, it's fun to talk about market structure and so on. If you're talking to someone who knows what they're doing, they're a trader, they're rich or whatever, their money is their own problem, they know zero is a number, that's fine. When you're selling it to poor people as a way out, that's reprehensible. I think more generally, it preys on desperation. It's 2022. The poor are absolutely screwed. Everything sucks. So people have sold this stuff as a desperation way out. And I mean guillotines are in short supply i guess in the meantime we have crypto twitter <laughs> okay I, I think uh, that's a good place to wrap it yep that's gonna do it